Oh, hi, everyone. Uh, if you were watching this later, my name is Guitar Gabby. I am very much excited to be here to talk to you all a little bit today about some of the business behind music. I will admit that starting off, um, I did not, there are a lot of things uh, with regards to entering into the music industry that I thought I had figured out, that I thought I knew. But then uh, as I started uh, really building onto my trajectory and figuring out what success would look like for me, um, there were a lot of things that I realized I needed to know in order to have um, a long-term strategic, fruitful uh, career inside of the entertainment industry. So I want to share some of those things with you all today. And I'm gonna just go ahead and switch over to our flow for today. And so we're gonna be talking a little bit about behind the music, setting your trajectory. Um, trajectory is, um, I think something that is very important no matter what industry you're in, but trajectory is really just figuring out a way to set yourself up um, to be uh, on the path of success. Part of that's gonna be setting goals for yourself. Part of that is gonna be realist being is being realistic with yourself about some of the things that you might or might not be good at and how you can leverage the support and strengths of others around you, your fan base, your team and friends that will um, really help to contribute to a bigger goal, a bigger vision. So um, this is actually um, a beginning activity that I think uh, any of us can do. Um, and I would highly recommend revisiting some of these questions or revisiting this activity that we're gonna do right now um, periodically throughout throughout the coming years and periodically even you know over the coming weeks. But um, one thing that I really had to sit down and figure out and ask myself was what part of the entertainment industry am I interested in being in? Um, you know, at first I thought that I just wanted to be uh, a musician. I thought at one point that I wanted to have a band and tour around the world. And I thought that all of those things were uh, would be happening in silos. Little did I know I would be able to do all of those things and then some um, all you had, to, or all I had to do was switch the lens uh, by which I was looking at stuff and how I was evaluating um, and building onto my own trajectory. Um, and then the second part of that to think about is what led you to music. Um, and this is something that you can definitely, I encourage everybody to, to think about periodically, um, even when you're by yourself. Sometimes during my skincare routine um, sections of the evening, um, my evening wind down routine, I will stop and think about my journey. Um, and I think that that's good to reflect on one because, you know, definitely pat yourself on the back. You know, everybody um, in life is going to have challenges and you definitely deserve to applaud yourself for the victories that you have um, that you have overcome and that um, the things that you have accomplished. Um, so just really thinking about what led you to music, um, which leads me to part of my journey with that. So I am um, born and raised in Atlanta. I graduated from Spelman College and then uh, a year after that, my mom uh, suggested, hey, you should check out law school. Uh, I was initially not thinking about that. I was thinking about, you know, graduating from my undergrad and moving on into the entertainment industry. Um, I had started playing for Diamond, uh, a rapper here out of the Atlanta, um, former Atlanta rap group called Crime Mob. Um, and so I started playing for her and, and figured, well, this is going to be it. This is going to be how I start touring and become, you know, a, a touring session musician. Um, but that journey actually led me in a different direction while I was still putting together the Tulips Band. Um, and part of that journey was learning about management and learning about the business side um, behind, behind music. And that was one of the first opportunities that I was exposed to where I really, really, really realized that everybody um, in the entertainment industry is not going to always understand how to cater to or work with musicians. Um, some people uh, don't know how to cater to and work with vocalists. Um, all of us, uh, while we're all creative and inside of this massive creative space that we know as the entertainment industry, figuring out how to pivot your strategy again and figuring out how to get people on your team that know how to communicate with you and then um, be able to turn around and communicate with someone different on your team is definitely a skill set um, that you have to learn no matter what part of the industry you're in. Um, and the other side of that is learning how to be strategic, learning how to think strategically, learning how to um, observe things that are happening in front of you and seeing things from a different lens so that you can make an informed uh, strategic pivot um, to continue moving and continue building onto what it is that you're currently um, building onto. So that led me to going to Vermont Law School. Um, uh, and from there, I started um, taking additional learning credits and cert uh, got certifications in intellectual property from Yale's Law School, Yale University Law School. And um, from there, I'm just continuing to build onto the Tulips Band. Um, 
which to me is just really an important uh, space for, for women and gender nonconforming musicians worldwide uh, to participate when they want, when they can, and however much or however little capacity they would love to participate in. The Tulip Span is really just that um, inclusive, diverse space for everybody to come uh, contribute to a common goal of putting something good back out into the world through our creativity. Um, so that's led me to uh, becoming a writer for Guitar World Magazine, uh, She Shreds Magazine, and um, also uh, being on the board for Girls Rock Asheville and the Girls Rock Camp Alliance. Um, and then a couple of years into my journey was uh, blessed to be able to join the Recording Academy. And I have to add this really quick in there because I recently um, just announced that I'm running for a governor uh, position on the Recording Academy Atlanta Chapter Board of Directors. So I'm really excited um, to be running that race. Um, and then additionally, just coming on as a diversity editor for Guitar Girl Magazine and talent and outreach acquisitions internal consultant. <laughs> no, that's a mouthful. Uh, before a conservation-based organization called ACE. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about the Tulips Consulting Group and a couple of different legs of the Tulips Band. But um, I first want to start with what, you know, who are the Tulips Band and what exactly is our mission? Um, we are a global entity that triples as a self-management firm, a consulting group, and an international touring collective. Um, everybody inside of the Tulips Band, um, on the executive team and the musicians are called the Tulips Gang. Um, and we are all a group of professional women and gender nonconforming folk that challenge the equality of powers in every industry. Um, and that's really important because we do believe that representation is power, um, not just for ourselves, but for, um, for young people like yourself and, and others that you might know um, that are following in our footsteps. And we're following in the footsteps of those that came before us. So one thing that we were, uh, that's very important to us is um, giving back to the communities that we are a product of um, and just sharing knowledge because knowledge is power. Um, which brings me to our mission, which is to inspire diverse rock stars worldwide to challenge the boundaries set in various industries. We do this, pro we do this by providing direct access to music, business, and legal education to marginalized groups. Um, which brings me to the three different sectors, three different faces of the Tulip Span. And all of this really got started from me um, trying and failing, falling and having to get back up. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of the, um, the business and legal things um, that helped me to, to grow the Tulips Band to where we are now. But the self-management firm um, side of the Tulips Band is really just meant to provide access, immediate access to education. So participating in workshops such as this one um, and sharing out this content and this knowledge that I've been blessed to, to learn along the way is very important to us. I'm sorry, so the self-management side of the Tulips um, is really just aimed to provide that immediate access to marginalized groups that are underrepresented in the entertainment industry. The second phase of the Tulips Band is uh, a consulting group. Um, so the Tulips Consulting Group is made up of various members of the Tulips Gang, all of which uh, have different backgrounds in nonprofit development, um, board of directors, strategic planning, you name it, we bring it to the table. And we work together to really um, change the framework of uh, and perspective of industries um, that we exist in and just really challenge um, some of those, um, some of those uh, the way that people view things and way they go about things. And then the last part, the last face of the Tulip Span is the International Touring Rock Collective uh, part. Um, and these are some cool highlights over the years. We got to headline a show um, in Florida. This is with Girls Rock uh, St. Petersburg, actually, a couple of years ago. I think this was in 2019. Uh, and then this is playing Afropunk Atlanta. Um, I think this was our third slot playing or third opportunity playing with Afropunk. And this was in 2019. And then uh, our most recent opportunity um, here was playing the Women's Reproductive March um, here in Atlanta, Georgia last year. So I want everybody to spend a couple of moments in your spare time figuring out what exactly, um, going back to that question that we led with, which is what parts of the entertainment industry are you interested in and, and, and figuring out what things you're passionate about within that. Um, but the second part of that is gonna be figuring out a couple of things that you're passionate about that have nothing to do with music. And there's a reason for that. We'll come back to that in a minute. Um, and all of that really, uh, when you pull all of those things together, um, I like to uh, call that finding the intersections of your passions. I'm using myself as an example. You know, I mentioned earlier that I was um, very much interested in music um, at a young age, but I was also interested in conservation. Um, going to Spelman and Vermont Law School, both of my degrees were rooted in conservation and um, environmental law and policy. Um, and I, for a long time, was kind of put in a box, a mental box in school um, and just being out in the world where uh, I felt society was telling me as a young black woman that I had to pick 
um, I had to pick something. I had to pick one. I couldn't, I couldn't participate in different industries. I couldn't do different things that I was passionate about. You only get to pick one and you better do good at it. And that's kind of the narrative that was painted for me as I started my journey. Um, but I quickly realized that there are a lot of people like myself that are creative um, and that have more than one thing that they're passionate about. So what happens to, to those moments? What happens to those people when we're able to take the intersections of uh, our passion for, for um, zoology or conservation and, and mix that with your passion for music or your passion for painting? What happens when you combine all of those things? Um, in my opinion, you create a well-rounded, diverse, inclusive spaces where people are able to thrive in all of who they are um, and not just one part of who they are. So I would love everyone to just spend a couple of minutes really sitting down and writing out, one, what are some of the things inside of the entertainment industry that you're interested in? That could be from management. It could be to being a session musician. Perhaps you want to be on the A&R side. There's so many different, different sectors of the music industry. So take some time to figure out what are those areas that you're interested in. And then the second thing is figuring out what are some things that you're passionate about outside of music. And then through um, the rest of this agenda, we're going to work together to figure out how to find the intersections between your passions and then figuring out how to protect that art and then figuring out how to do that from how to set up your business um, to create the long term sustainable trajectory that you need um, in, a, in a vicious music industry and then figuring out how to protect your art, whether that's by yourself. Uh, filing as a solo, solo dolo type of work, or if you're going to be working um, with people, um, other people, whether that's bandmates or it could be uh, future business owners um, or business partners, but figuring out how to go about protecting your art. And then we're going to look at how to strategize for the future. So just starting with some of the why, like a lot of people um, uh, have asked, you know, hey, Gabby, what is what is the the what are the perks of, of being self-managed versus just getting with the label? I mean, everybody, everybody has this desire, you know, in the music industry to um, go viral, especially now with the social media age. But everybody has this vision of going viral and getting signed to a label and, you know, getting this advance. Uh, having all this money and the fame and the success and the followers on social media and the blue check marks. But the issue with that is that one, uh, there's no such thing as free money. All of that advanced money that people um, are getting through, uh, depending on the type of contract that they sign. But for the most part, I'm um, getting into some of those um, types of uh, 360 deals, for example, in the music industry really put you in a position where you one first and foremost have to pay back whatever advance you are given. Um, and, and that's very difficult to do. It sounds easy but it's very difficult to do um, because a lot of the, the music that you put out uh, streaming and getting um, charted is really contingent on your fan base. Are you able to engage your fan base in a way that's really, really gonna get them to want to stream your music 24 seven, thus giving you the opportunity to chart and um, being able to more quickly repay some of the money that you were given um, in advances. Um, another side of uh, the negative side of, of being, um, or one of the cons rather, with being signed to a label is that you lose autonomy. So a lot of our favorite artists, Doja Cat actually being a great example uh, because I just saw this the other day in the blogs, but um, I'm a huge fan of Doja Cat. I listen to Doja Cat's music all the time. I remember when Doja Cat first started putting out videos and to see the growth from, from where she started to where she is now is great, but there was a price to pay. And Doja Cat's been really vocal about that on social media. Um, and just uh, not just Doja Cat, but a lot of other artists, especially women in the industry, um, really just talking about how they don't get to pick, you know, what they wear or, you know, when they're able to arrive to things and, you know, when they can go on vacation. Somebody else, uh, when you're signed to some of these contracts, some of these, um, you lose a lot of autonomy um, and which leads to losing your own voice. Um, and that could mean creatively or it could mean just in a professional setting. Um, unfortunately, this industry is set up uh, to where the artist um, is, is not always on the best side of the deal. The artist um, is a lot of times, again, in spaces where we're losing autonomy, not able to have, have your voice heard and, and, and adding to having the creative freedom to dictate your future and your path and to dictate how you want to move forward into things. Um, but one of the biggest things, one of the most important things, if you leave from this workshop recording, um, or, or if you're here today with us, one of the biggest things that I ask you to take away is ownership because ownership is something that I believe this world does not place a lot of value on unless it is a tangible thing, but is the intangible things 
that truthfully have um, the most value. Um, and so we're gonna talk a little bit about ownership of your business and ownership of your art. So starting off with business formation, one of the first things that uh, an attorney mentor of mine um, told me, um, this was before I went to law school and before I really started learning a lot about the business side of the industry, but he told me that you need to set up your LLC. And I thought, well, I, why? I'm just, you know, I'm just, I have a band. I just, you know, kind of wanted to, you know, make music, but he, you know, he kept reminding me and kept uh, teaching me lots of great things along the way, which is um, you need to treat your, your business like a business because that's what it is in the entertainment industry. Um, either you're going to be on the side of business or either you're going to be on the side of uh, being an artist um, that a lot of times is put in, in boxes like we just talked about where you lose autonomy, losing your voice and um, do not have ownership of your music. And that is not a fun place to be. So one of the first things that I recommend is definitely setting up your business formation. And LLC is probably going to be one of the easiest structures um, to set up if you're starting off, especially um, in any industry. This doesn't have to just be um, limited to entertainment or music, but um, figuring out how you can set up your company. Um, you can go about it a couple of different ways, but let's talk a little bit about what an LLC is. An LLC is a limited liability company, which is a business structure in the US where the owners are not personally liable for the company's debts or liabilities. Limited liability companies are hybrid entities that combine the characteristics of a corporation with those of a partnership or sole proprietorship. So what does that mean? Basically your LLC is a business structure that will allow you to start building your business, um, which is not cheap. Uh, building a business from the ground up, no matter how you, you're filed in um, with your secretary of state, but building your business from the ground up is extremely expensive. And that is something that I will be very transparent about because I think oftentimes it's easy for all of us to look at other people on social media and say, wow, they have it all. This happened overnight. But the tr truth is, is that this started 15 years ago when I first picked up the guitar, when I first started wandering um, around and, and tried to figure out what part of the industry do I even want to be in? I um, mean, what are the things that come along with that? What am I gonna need to know if I want to take that, uh, take this path of setting up and running a business? Um, and what exactly does that look like? What does my business plan look like? Um, and how much money is this gonna cost? Um, and it's expensive from rehearsal spaces to studio time, to rentals, to insurance, to gas, to per diems, to outfits. It costs money to set up and run a business. But if you're set up like an LLC in the United States, you will not be personally held liable for the company's debts. Um, and so that means when you go to file your taxes every year, uh, of course, it would you'd be um, sending in all of the uh, information and receipts that you uh, have been collecting over the years. If you've been tracking payments that you pay out to musicians, um, really just uh, tracking all of those things and collecting those receipts. And when you go to file your taxes at the end of the year, your accountant will be able to help or should be able to help you figure out how to offset some of the cost um, that you had to dump into your growing company that has yet to receive um, or has yet to gotten into um, a system of, of revenue. Um, so your LLC is a great starting structure um, that, that a lot of people use to, uh, to set up their businesses in the entertainment industry. Um, along with that, why are LLCs uh, great? Because a lot of the debt, like we were just talking about, all the expenses that come with setting up a business, but a lot of the debt that owners are not personally held liable for can be written off at the end of the fiscal year on your taxes. But it's very important to make sure that you're tracking these things and that you are keeping up with your receipts. So from this slide, if you had any takeaway to write down, the takeaway would be an LLC is a limited liability company. And the second thing would be to keep track of your receipts and any money that you dump into setting up your business from your trademark fees to your LLC fees to going to Target to purchase business supplies and, and post-it notes, collect all of those receipts, um, spend some time putting those into some sort of spreadsheet or tracking system. So that way at the end of the year, you can uh, write all of those things off at your taxes and continue to grow from there. The last thing that I will write down from this slide or the third thing that I will write down from this slide is how do you even do that? Um, you can do this one of two ways. One of those ways would be going directly to your secretary of state. Um, I live in Georgia, so for me, it's sos.ga.gov. Um, but if you are in a different state, you would just type in secretary of state um, for your state. Uh, you could say Michigan um, or Colorado um, and just uh, go to your secretary of state website and then you will be able to see, you should be able to see um, 
a tab that will say something along the lines of business setup or um, a setting up a business in that state. The second way that you can do that is by going through a third party. And a third party is going to be someone like um, an attorney or a lawyer um, or going through a third party entity such as LegalZoom. Um, the downside with that is that it is it, it costs a lot more money. I'll be honest with you. It costs a little bit more money because you are having to pay um, a lawyer time to go in and set that up. Um, but the plus side of that is that if you are not um, confident or not sure that you know what's going on and, and making sure you have all the correct information the first time you set up your LLC, then paying a third party consultant um, or going through LegalZoom, for example, um, will really help you to uh, make sure that you have all of those things, your T's crossed and your I's dotted the first time instead of having to go back and redo things later. So in summation, the first thing you're going to write down is what a limited liability LLC company is. Second thing you're going to write down is that if you um, keep up with your receipts and all your expenses, you can write those off in your taxes at the end of the year. And the third thing that you're going to write down is how you're, um, how to set up your LLC. And you can do that through either a third party entity like LegalZoom or a consultant, or you can do that by going directly to your secretary of state. So you have your, your LLC set up. So now we got to figure out uh, if you're a musician like I am, then uh, you write music. Um, or if you are uh, a writer, um, like for a magazine, or if you write books, or if you're a painter, all of these are creative forms um, of intellectual property. So we have to figure out how do we go about protecting our art now that we have our business uh, set up. So that's going to be where copyright comes in. Copyright is a form of intellectual property that grants the owner, being you, the exclusive rights to the tangible expression of, of a work. The first thing to write down with regards to copyright is going to be tangible expression of a work because it is very important um, that something is tangible in order to legally recognize some sort of legal protection or copyright of that work. Um, technically, uh, when, you, when you come up with an idea, like right now I'm gonna da, 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 da. So I just came up with a song. Is that song mine? Yes, because why? It came out of my head. It was an idea that I just came up with. However, the issue with that is that me singing that exact same tune out in a public forum without any sort of legally recognized protection gives me exposure um, or vulnerability rather, the bad kind of vulnerability to someone else taking that work and saying that it is theirs. Um, is it right? No. But is that the way the world is set up, unfortunately? Yes. So what do we do about that? Well, we can go and file for our copyright. Um, I'm not gonna play this full video for the sake of time, but I will make sure that I link this video link this video here, which does a wonderful job about explaining copyright and fair use. Um, so I'll make sure that I include um, that in our summation um, packet that I send over. Um, but why should you care about copyright and what happens when you copyright something? So when you copyright something, you are basically, um, again, getting federally recognized protection of your work. And along with that protection comes six exclusive rights. And we're gonna talk about some of those in a little bit in detail. Um, but the importance of these six exclusive rights is that it protects, again, legally recognized, protects your art from other people infringing on or violating what you have created. An example would be this illustration right here. So a couple of years ago, I wrote a series about business um, behind the music um, industry for She Shreds Magazine. And they had an illustrator on staff that went through um, and read through the final drafts. Um, and before these uh, were published, she created these really cool illustrations that aligned with each of the subject matter that we were talking about in each, um, in each installment. So if I were to take this photo and post it on my social media and say, hey, y'all, go, um, go read my article. All of this stuff inside of this article belongs to me. This came out of my head. It is all mine. That would be me infringing on Maria Rodriguez's um, copyright because I did not create this work. And I did not give her credit for creating that work. So that could be easily misinterpreted. So a good way to, a good way to avoid um, copyright infringement or accidental infringement or intentional infringement is to simply uh, give people, give credit where it's due. So whenever I use this photo or whenever I post a picture um, that one of my photographers have done, I'm always, always, always sure to make sure that I credit the artist that contributed to that and make it clear that this is something that uh, was created by this person for the purposes of whatever I created. The other important thing to write down um, 
with copyright is that copyright will last 70 years after death. So for example, if I filed a copyright for a song called The Deadpool and I filed that copyright and it was granted today, which is that wouldn't happen that fast unless you paid a lot of money for it. But if I were to get granted my copyright um, for The Deadpool today, um, I, I have legally recognized copyright protection from today until I pass away. And then 70 years, an additional 70 years after I pass away. So copyright is not necessarily something that, uh, that lasts in perpetuity or lasts um, to the ends of the earth, to the ends of time. Um, copyright does have a limit on it, but there's a lot of uh, caveats with that that kind of contribute to the life of songs uh, in the music industry. The big takeaway from this slide is copyright, which is a form of intellectual property that grants you, the owner, the exclusive right to a tangible expression of a work. And the second thing you wanna write down is give credit where it's due. So let's talk a little bit about the exclusive rights. We're not gonna go through all of these, um, uh, but we're gonna go through some of the, uh, the most important ones. But um, first and foremost, uh, the reproduction right um, is the, uh, gives you the copyright owner, the right to reproduce something. So what does that look like? Um, so I have a song called The Deadpool. I released The Deadpool and somebody out there wanted to reproduce the song because they, they heard it, felt inspired by it, and wanted to reproduce it, remaster it. They have to get permission from me because I'm the copyright owner and I'm the only one that has the permission to say yes or no, you can reproduce my song. Um, so that's the uh, kind of a, a quick snapshot of the reproduction right. Second one is gonna be your adaptation right, which gives the copyright owner the right to make and authorize the making of derivative works that are based on the copyrighted work. So what does that look like? Um, Smells Like Teen Spirit is one of, uh, one of my band's favorite songs to cover. We did a rendition of this a couple of years ago, um, right before opening for the Indigo Girls. And um, that uh, was a great example of a derivative work because we created a, a new version with our special um, uh, twang to it, if you will, um, based off of the original work. So in order for us to then take the addition that we made, the rendition that we made that we loved oh so much, and uh, we wanted to make it accessible uh, to the general public to be able to stream, we had to get, what we're gonna talk about in a little bit, we had to get a permission from the copyright owner being um, the label that owns uh, Kurt Cobain's music. And we had to get uh, what's called a mechanical license through the adaptation right to get permission to sell uh, our version that was derived off of the original work to the general public. So in summation, the adaptation right is granting the copyright owner the right to authorize the making of different works that are based off of the copyrighted work, the original work. Your next one is gonna be your public distribution right. And that grants the copyright owner, copyright owner the exclusive right to distribute copies of the work publicly or authorized distribution. A really quick example of that is gonna be magazines. So for example, um, being on a magazine cover, um, the artist or the photographer that took that photo uh, has to make sure that all of their copyrights for that photo are in place, all of their contracts with the artists in that photo are taken care of, and then they have to be able to uh, give access or permission to that magazine entity to create different copies and distribute this published magazine edition um, or authorize somebody to make copies of that and distribute it to the general public. The next one is gonna be your public performance right, which gives the copyright owner the right to exclusively perform the work or grant permission of it to be performed. Um, and that one's pretty straightforward. Just again, giving permission uh, for someone to make money off of um, per performing somebody else's work. So if we wanted to cover a Foo Fighters song, uh, rest in peace to Taylor Hawkins, um, we would, and make money off of that, we would have to get um, public performance right permission from the owner of whatever song uh, it is that we are wanting to perform and make money off of. The last one is going, or second to last one is your public display, right? Which creates the copyright owner the right to publicly display your work. A great quick example of that is gonna be um, if you're an artist and you have uh, a canvas, a beautiful canvas that you um, painted and you want to display this work in a museum um, that, that is open for the general public to purchase tickets to come in and see the works on the wall. You as the artist have the right to say yes or no, you want your work to publicly displayed. Again, um, one of the key factors in all of these things is that, um, well, let me not say that because it, it depends. Um, so, and then the last thing is gonna be your digital audio transmission, right? Which gives, which gives the copyright owner of a sound recording 
the right to publicly perform the work by means of digital audio transmission and the exclusive right to others to do so. So me as the copyright owner granting um, someone else permission to um, publicly perform a sound recording of one of my songs, for example, in a digital audio transmission way. So uh, a lot of times that really, um, that's re very relevant to television performances or getting sync licenses um, for songs that are placed in different types of um, uh, movies and TV shows. So this leads us to joint ownership. So uh, joint ownership is another type of copyright or it's not another type of copyright. It's more so um, um, a, one of the tiers underneath copyright for how you can go about copywriting a work. Um, typically, uh, if you are an individual um, or a solo artist, you would go and file your copyright. If you wrote everything, lyrics and music, top to bottom by yourself, then you would go and file your copyright with copyright.gov. Um, as a sole uh, work. But let's say you worked with your band to create a song um, and you all wanted to make sure that you got your copyright taken care of so that you can upload it onto streaming platforms and sell it to your fans. Well, that's gonna be called a joint ownership. Um, and with the joint ownership, the most important thing to note is that others are considered joint copyright owners. So that means that if you, or I'll use my cat, if, if, my, if my cat Gracie and I wrote a song together, um, and we decide to file for joint ownership because she wrote the music and I wrote the lyrics, then we both have equal say-so um, in, in ownership of this work. What that also means is that all of the six exclusive rights that we just talked about and that we just looked at are gonna be available to exercise for my cat and for myself. So with joint ownership, both parties or all parties that are involved have equal access an equal say so and equal uh, participation in exercising the six exclusive rights that come along with registering that work. The how to file uh, your art uh, is gonna be the next biggest thing um, in setting trajectory for your career. You can do this one of two ways, similar to, similarly to how we talked about our LLC. You can do that by going directly to copyright.gov. I will be honest with you, copyright.gov can be very uh, confusing. Um, if you are not sure how to go about filing your copyright, there are lots of different subcategories of copywriting. Um, a lot of it also is contingent on um, having published materials versus unpublished materials. Um, you can file for copyright for both, but the way the process by which you go about each of these different types of copyright can be very confusing. And what I will say also to write down is that the federal government does not give refunds. So if you messed up with your copyright the first time, and you realize after you submit it, you know, oh snap, I meant to, to add this. They're not gonna give you a refund and you cannot do it over again. Now you can cancel the application or you can call up there, but they're not gonna roll your money over to a new application. Um, so in this instance, if you are not familiar with the uh, navigating through the copyright.gov website, this is where I would recommend investing your money into a third party to help guide you through the process. Um, and I say guide you through the process and not necessarily do on your behalf. Um, so that way you can learn. So that way next time uh, you can go directly to copyright.gov and do it yourself. But I would recommend, uh, again, if you're not familiar with navigating through the copyright.gov website, definitely encourage you to work with the third party to guide you through that process. And that can be working with a lawyer or attorney or going through a third entity like LegalZoom. And so scooting into um, kind of the last, the last part of bringing all of this together is gonna to be the strategy. So what exactly, in, why is strategy important? Um, well, strategy is very important um, because it will help you align your career trajectory that you're on. Um, a lot of times uh, when we think about strategy, um, it can be a little overwhelming just because you're thinking about all of the things uh, and all of the goals that you want to accomplish in your first five years or your first 10 years. Um, and then you, it's, it's easy to get caught up in, well, you know, 10 years from now or 15 years from now, I wanna be this big global entity. Um, and it can be a little overwhelming. So um, one thing that, that I would say uh, is starting off slow, starting off nice and easy and just figuring out what direction you even want to go in. There's no rush, there's no rush. There's plenty out here for everybody. There are lots of resources. Um, but the one thing that is extremely, extremely important and valuable um, that you cannot get back is time and money. So 
if you're if you're out here and you're just really anxious about you know I got to get this set up I got to do this right now and right now right now you, you could get it done now but if you're not meticulous and you're not thinking through all of the different angles for this first step in your strategy we're losing out on time and money and both of those things you cannot get back and you're going to need a lot of as you're strategizing for your future so one of the first things I would say is again starting off easy by writing out some of your short and long term goals. This will help you figure out what direction you're headed in. It will also allow you the advantage of setting goals and working towards them. And not only that, but I'd like to add to that, just patting yourself on the back. Whenever you reach one of those short-term goals, giving yourself um, a pat on the back and, and congratulating yourself. I have an affirmations wall in my room um, that I started uh, last year um, because I realized that a lot of the goals and strategy and ideas that I had for for growing out the tulips man were great but they were all in my head and I found myself uh, I'll be transparent I, I found myself at times being very overwhelmed um because there was just so many things to do I was in law school full-time we were touring I was working full-time and, and 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 it was just a lot so I had to really manage my expectations um for myself and really just be patient by writing out my goals um and every now and then I do I do go back to some of my journals um, where I've written out some of those goals and I just look at it to make sure, am I still on track with, with the general trajectory or direction that I wanted to go in? How am I doing with working towards them? And um, the other thing that I will say to that is that you'd be surprised how many goals you'll write out and time flies, you know, in two years from now, you go back and, and stumble across a notebook. This happened to me a couple of months ago, but I stumbled across the, a, a notebook of crumpled up paper um, folded up inside um, and they were goals that I wrote out for the Tulip Span in 2016 and uh, somehow lost track of those things, but looked up uh, in 2021 and realized, wow, a lot of these goals that we set, we have accomplished. And not only have we accomplished them, but we've surpassed the, the um, we surpassed the context of the original goal and we've opened up the door to something bigger and better um, where everybody on the Tulips team has collaborated to make it just an even more awesome thing. Um, so definitely spend time writing out your goals, short-term and long-term, develop a habit of consistency and goal setting, because the more disciplined you become, um, the more sustainable you become. And once you become sustainable in your actions and become consistent in those things, um, it'll help the process kind of go by a little bit smoother and it'll help you kind of manage um, what's happening and the expectations a little bit more, a little bit easier. The second thing is gonna be writing out all of the things you want to accomplish within those short-term goals in details. So one of your short-term goals, for example, might be set up my business. Well, what do you need to set up your business? You need to set up a business license, and you're going to do that by going to sos.whateveryourstateis.gov. Um, once you do that, you're going to probably want to register for your trademark. Um, we, I filed for my trademark for my company name, I think like two years after I set up our business license or my, my uh, mentor set up my business license. Um, and then after that, I started, uh, once I understood the trademark and copyright system directly with the Secretary of State and the federal government, then I was able to go in and start doing additional trademarks um, that I needed um, on my own because I understood the system a little bit more. But it took me like a good five, six years and a lot of mentorship and a lot of support and education. Um, so, and then one of the other things that you might need uh, in, your, in your short-term goals is copywriting your work. This is something that I think a lot of times us as musicians and artists and songwriters and painters and as creatives, we miss this because we think, oh, well, you know, I'm just going to put it on SoundCloud. Oh, you know, I'm just going to, you know, put it up on streaming. Nobody's going to really stream it. But I, it goes back to developing consistency and developing good habits. I would highly recommend that you get in the good habit of copywriting your work because everybody in this world is not excited to see you win. There are some people who spend twice as much time on the computer figuring out how they can take what somebody else has created because they don't necessarily feel like going through that process because it is tedious. It requires patience, it requires discipline, consistency, money. It requires investing, requires investing in yourself. And that is difficult to do for any of us as humans. So one of the best things to do in protecting yourself is again, business license, trademarking your things, copywriting your things, making sure all of your intellectual property um, are taken care of and creating a routine schedule to keep you working to towards your long-term goals. Um, which leads me to the third thing in this entire how to strategize, which is ready, set, repeat. It gets difficult because consistency is difficult. Um, I'll be the first to admit that I have fallen off on my, on my routine schedules often. This actually, the last two weeks has been a great example. I got sick 
um, a couple of weeks ago um, on a business trip and just completely got off schedule with working out and with yoga and everything. And it's been three weeks and I just got back on track like literally today. And I can, <laughs> I'm trying not to let it go off track again because I'm going out of town back to back next week. And um, it gets difficult to, to be consistent with your routines, um, especially when you're not in your environment. So a lot of this stuff definitely um, is, is not saying that you have to be perfect, but it's just a reminder that we're all human. Um, and if you fall, it's okay. Just don't stay down, get back up. Um, and then one of the last things to, to strategize for your future is figuring out your marketing and your branding. What exactly is your brand? What makes you you? Why should people care? What makes you different from uh, another guitarist that I heard playing at the same venue? Or what makes you different than another band that's on the same lineup? Figuring out, and it doesn't make any of us less or more valuable than the others. It just makes us different, which is great in a creative space, right? Um, so really figuring out, spending some time to think about what is your brand? Why should people care? What makes you different? Um, and one activity that I love to do, and I still do this just to kind of keep me on my toes, um, but spending some time going through photos on the internet of some of my favorite artists. Prince and Beyonce are two of my faves to do this activity with. Um, I'll type in Beyonce online or type in Prince and go to the images tab or sometimes just scroll through on social media hashtags and looking for some of the similarities and consistencies in their outfits in the way that they respond to interview questions, in the way that they interact with fans. Those things um, that, are, that become habitual um, are part of how you market your brand. Um, so once you figure out what, you know, what those things are and, and what makes you unique in a world of many, that's going to be your brand. And then we have to figure out how to market your brand to different audiences. So the activity um, that I would love to recommend to everybody to do is spend some time thinking about who you are. Um, journaling is a, is a great way to figure out some of these things as you're setting your long and short-term goals. But figuring out who you are, um, what people on the outside see when they hear your music or when they see a photo of you, what message do you want to convey to your potential audience? Do you represent things that might relate to certain demographics of people? Um, as a black woman, there are um, certain perspectives and optics of my experience that when I share on social media, I know that other black women um, will be able to relate to. Um, but then there are also moments where I'm talking about being in a professional context and just being a woman in, in a professional corporate environment that I know other women out there, no matter what their race or ethnic background is, can relate to. So you got to figure out how to convey who you are and what you represent and how you can relate to other people um, of different audiences. Um, and you can do that through social media. You can do that through um, just doing speaking engagements, reaching out to getting interviews. Um, I will say a great way to, to do this is reaching out to um, small blog entities and, and magazine entities and just asking for an interview. Um, you know, being willing to, to be rejected, being willing to hear a no, because that is a big part uh, of being in the industry, I'm um, in any industry. Um, but figuring out ways that you can kind of get more involved in the press um, and marketing space is a really, really, really big advantage. Because what's going to come with that is a lot of the same questions being asked to you different ways. And it'll give you the opportunity to really figure out how to answer um, a question about who you are and what brought you to music with one audience. Um, but then figuring out how to, how to switch up that, that same response um, in a different context to a different environment of let's say younger, um, younger people. So get creative and figure out what your marketing, what your branding is and how to convey all of those things to your audiences. And then last but not least is educating yourself. Knowledge is power. Um, you know, there are, I think that there's in, in, in society um, and I, I don't know that it's just America. I think it could be really anywhere, um, but there can be a lot of pressure, societal pressure to go to a four-year school um, and, and do something that aligns with your major and stay working in that industry. That was the trajectory that I subconsciously felt that I was on for a really long time until I decided, what if I wanna get knowledge from experience? What if I just wanna try stuff and fail? That's knowledge too. Um, sometimes uh, knowledge can be taking online courses. I've taken a lot of online courses, especially in law school. Um, I took a lot of supplementary online courses to kind of learn how people think um, in different industries to, to figure out how to navigate. Um, some of that could be following your favorite YouTuber. I follow a lot of YouTube bloggers because, uh, and some of, some of the time it's funny, sometimes it's trash YouTube, and sometimes it's business YouTube, but all of, all of it is important because it shows you something that you can't always get in the textbook or at a four-year college, which is learning how to interact with people and learning how people think. 
And that's not something that you only get in the context of a four-year um, college or university. So all of it is needed, all of it is good, um, but I highly encourage you to just dig into education, Google things, read things, read all of the, the, the blogs about the same content. Everybody out there is gonna give you something different. And um, my mom always told me growing up, take the meat and leave the bone. Um, and that leads me to executing your strategy. Once you get all of these things together and you've learned all of these things and you've read books and followed influencers that give you different perspectives, you take the meat, you take what works for you and you leave the rest if it doesn't work for you or if it's not applicable to you right now. Once you combine all of those things, put it on the table. Um, I like to call, call this section my strategy lab. Um, and this is when, when I really get creative with experimenting and figuring out. It's kind of like a, like a puzzle in your head. <laughs> um, but taking all of those things, putting it on the table and figuring out, hmm, what if I take this piece and add it to this piece on this timeline? Okay, that might work. I think we might have something. Um, and then tapping, it, tapping in my team and saying, hey, what do you all think about this? Getting different uh, perspectives, getting different input um, is very much needed. But it's gonna lead you on a path to one, make mistakes, because it happens, none of us are perfect. So this is not at all meant to say you've got to be perfect. This is about learning, trial, error, and getting back up and continuing to go. Um, and the second thing is definitely being willing to be vulnerable with yourself and the world around you. Um, uh, being told no is actually a great example of being vulnerable um, because it's difficult to be told no. It's difficult to be in environments where everybody says yes, but they really mean no. Um, so you've got to learn how to discern, um, and kind of just, you know, figure out how to navigate through those, some of those spaces and being told no yourself um, or having to say no to other people, which is very uncomfortable um, sometimes. But the benefits of it in the long run are um, being able to continue to grow and being able to try new things and in the long run, developing a successful trajectory or career. And the last thing is just being uh, most importantly, which is continue to go and to not stop. So, um, yeah. This is all of the social medias. Would love to connect with everybody and we'll be sending out this PowerPoint presentation with all of the, all the good information and links. And I really appreciate your time.